Uh, so yeah, so thanks, Nick. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today to have the opportunity to present this facet of my work to the Paleo Med community because I haven't often talked about this with you guys. Um, and so in this presentation, I'm gonna walk through some of my research uh, that I've worked on over the last eight years, focusing on the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary and the mass extinction event. And so at the core of this work is an important outstanding question kind of in the field of earth science, and that is what causes large scale global ecosystem collapse, such as mass extinction events. And so by the end of this talk, I'm hoping to show you how we can use paleomagnetism to help us answer this important outstanding question. And so this question is important, not only for our understanding of Earth's past, but also for Earth's fu or future, um, as we have anthropogenic climate change, uh, deforestation, sea level rise, um, in addition to pollution, among other things, threatening global ecosystem collapse, potentially in scale or similar scale to past mass extinction events. Um, and so the question kind of at the foundation of this talk is how do we turn or determine it? And how do we go about determining the cause of a mass extinction event? Um, and so in order to answer this question, we need to be able to tie forcing mechanisms uh, such as large meteor impacts or large scale volcanism um, to observed records of environmental change. And so this can be global warming, global cooling, sea level rise, sea level fall, um, and then ultimately to observe biotic change and observed extinction events. And so to do this at a first order, we need to be able to prove that these events are closely associated in time. And so how do we go about dating events related to a mass extinction? Um, well, right now, there are currently four main methods that are used to date mass extinction events. And these include um, absolute geochrono or geochronologic techniques such as uranium lead geochronology and argon argon geochronology in addition to indirect techniques, including paleomagnetism and also astronomical tuning. And so now jumping into a little bit of background on each of these techniques. So uranium-led geochronology is really useful for dating silicic igneous units. And so this, and in some mafic units where you might find videlite um, or regions where you have an area that got more compositionally um, well, evolved. Um, and so these silicic units can include uh, silicic tephras that are in or intercalated between sedimentary deposits and terrestrial sections. Um, we can also date bedeliate in some environments in large igneous provinces, or where we have ashes that kind of interbed these lava flows. Um, uranium led geochronology is really useful because it has high precision. 0.1% is easy, 0.02% is possible, which is insane. Um, and this is because of a huge community effort over the last 10 years trying to improve the precision of this technique. It's also an absolute technique, so we don't have to worry about community standards that we're using. Um, but one kind of fallback of this technique is it can be affected by the So con forms in magmatic environments pretty early on um, and, and lead doesn't always diffuse out quickly. It doesn't diffuse out at, at um, it only diffuses out at high temperatures. And so it's possible that the age you're interpreting as the age of eruption from a zircon may actually represent the age that it formed in the magma chamber which could be uh, thousands to tens to hundreds of thousands of years prior. And so for really, really old events, this isn't so much of an issue, but when we're looking at some of the younger mass extinctions, it's something we have to start thinking about. Uh, we also have astronomical tuning as a means to date uh, mass extinction events. And so astronomical tuning is really useful for dating and is very commonly used in marine sections. Um, there has been some new work looking at it in terrestrial realms, which has been really cool. Um, but it's not quite developed there yet. And so it, this technique is really great where we don't have the means for absolute dating. Um, it has the advantage that we can get high resolution with it. So we can get upwards of 20,000 year or resolution. Um, but beyond 50 million years ago, which is our oldest, ma our youngest mass extinction event is 66 million years ago. So this is all mass extinction events. We don't have astronomical solutions. And so this means that um, we have to anchor our astronomical solution to absolutely dated anchor points. And then these absolutely dated anchor points um, now have all of the other issues that are related to what we need to worry about when we're using absolute techniques. Um, and then also signals during mass extinction events might be obscured in some ways due to changes in sedimentation um, because particularly in 
particularly in deep marine sections, your sedimentation is animals that lived in the ocean. Uh, so if they all of a sudden went extinct, you can imagine that sedimentation might have changed a bit. Um, and next we have argon geochronology. And so this is also a really useful high precision absolute technique. We can use it to date silicic and mafic igneous rocks in addition to potassium rich melt rocks. Um, and so again, useful in um, tephras in uh, terrestrial realms and tricolated between sedimentary deposits. Also useful for actually dating the basalt in large igneous provinces. Um, it can also achieve high precision 0.1% or better. Uh, we don't worry about magma resonance time. Argon's a noble gas. It doesn't like sticking around in, in the grains at high temperatures. It diffuses out. Um, but we do have some issues with absolute calibration with this technique in that we have to get ages based on a community standard. To get this kind of J value, this is our neutron fluence. We put these samples in a nuclear reactor. Um, and so we don't always agree in the community on the absolute ages of those standards. Um, but if you're just looking at the argon technique alone and only comparing argon data to argon data, we don't have to worry about this. Um, and so the final one is paleomagnetism. And so paleomagnetism is actually one of the most useful techniques for dating mass extinction events um, because it can be used to resolve a range of time scales. And so we're not just restricted to uh, what we can date with our technique. We can get time scales on the order of hundreds to thousands of years using secular variation. And then also longer time scales if we look at magnetostratigraphy. It's also recorded in just about every geologic environment. And so we can find it in terrestrial and marine realms in igneous and sedimentary rocks. Um, and then also we can use reversals as a means for correlation between events. And we can kind of look at them as globally synchronous time points. And synchronous here, we know they're not synchronous. But when we're looking at the large scale effects of mass extinctions and we're trying to correlate, we can kind of think of it as like a quick snapshot. Um, and so paleomagnetism overall still has a really important role in helping us to understand mass extinction events. And so for the rest of this talk, I'm gonna be focusing on my own work using paleomagnetism um, to better understand the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary mass extinction. And so jumping into the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, what do we know about this event? Uh, well, it occurred 66 million years ago. It's our most recent mass extinction event. Uh, it killed over 50% of the species living on earth at the time. It led the way for the rise of mammals and the evolution of our own species. And then finally, the reason this event is one of the most well-known events in Earth history is because it killed all of the non-avian non dinosaurs. Um, and so the big question at you know, the core of this talk, what caused this mass extinction event? Well, it's generally agreed upon in the community that a majority of these extinction events associated with this boundary are abrupt and that they occurred coincidentally with the arrival of a large meteor that is currently recorded um, by the Chicxulub crater in the Yucatan Peninsula. And this is supported by evidence of the crater, but then also we have global iridium anomalies suggesting um, that there was this extraterrestrial impactor um, at the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary um, at sites worldwide. But despite the substantial evidence, um, there's other evidence that suggests that the Chicxulub impactor may not have been the only contributor to the mass extinction event. And so in addition to the impactor, we also have large scale volcanism on a scale unlike anything that's going on on Earth today um, that was ongoing around the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary uh, in the Deccan Traps, which is now in modern day India. Uh, and so due to this fact, and also tied to observations that terrestrial ecosystems may have been weakening in the late Cretaceous and also records of late Cretaceous climate change has led to the hypothesis that the Deccan played a role in the mass extinction. And so Deccan is kind of still this kind of giant elephant in the room when we talk about the KPG mass extinction event. And that's because we still don't fully understand its effects and whether or not it actually played any role um, in contributing to the mass extinction. Um, and so that's kind of been the goal of my own work is trying to better understand the role of the Deccan traps. Um, and this is just a photo of the Deccan. And just to give you guys an idea of scale, it crops out over an area the size of Texas which is pretty big. Um, this is only the upper third. This is a photo I took near Mahabaleshwar. Um, and each of these layers is one lava flow and they're about 30 meters thick, each layer. Um, so this gives you an idea of kind of how large scale that large scale volcanism is. Um, and so to clarify the role of the Deccan, myself and my collaborators worked to create this high resolution, high precision global chronologic framework that tied together records of terrestrial ecological change um, to records of climate change and records of 
biotic change in the marine realm, and then finally to records of Deccan volcanism. And so for this, we used both argon geochronology and also paleomagnetism. And we did this because in order for our work to be useful, we needed to be able to correlate it to other Cretaceous paleogene sites around the world. And so here, if I've, I, which is really difficult, there are 350 Cretaceous paleogene boundary sites around the world. And so here I've identified the different ways that these different realms are dominantly dated. And you can see that argon geochronology kind of crops out as our most obvious way to date terrestrial sections, the Chicxulub impact, and Deccan. Um, but also when we tie it to magnetostratigraphy, we can now better correlate our results that we're determining here to ones in the marine realm. And then also it allows for more precise and more high resolution correlation between these different sections. And so this is why we chose these two techniques. And so one of the reasons MagStrat is so useful for the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary is because the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary falls in the middle of Cron C29R, which you can see here. So we have two reversals that nicely bracket this extinction event, and they're both about um, a couple hundred thousand years before and then a couple hundred thousand years after the extinction. Uh, so now jumping into some of the work, we're going to jump into the uh, terrestrial realm. So this work was conducted in the Hell Creek region of northeastern Montana, uh, which is around the Fort Peck Reservoir, if any of you have been up in that area. Um, and so we chose to work in this area because the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary is really well defined here. Uh, it also has an amazing fossil record. Uh, we have numerous volcanic ashes with materials amenable to high precision argon geochronology recorded here. And then these sediments have also been shown in my work and in others work to be good paleomagnetic recorders. And so to better constrain the timing of terrestrial faunal change, I worked in close collaboration with other paleontologists um, to create this chronostratigraphic framework where we collected 33 ashes and 19 paleomagnetic sections, our sites are shown here, uh, which then included 3,000 single crystal total fusion experiments um, on individual sanity and grains for argon analyses. And then we demagnetized 285 paleomag samples. Uh, and so the reason this work had to be so large in scale is because these are fluvial deposits. Uh, they are very complicated um, for stratigraphy. These are two different sections uh, and you wouldn't know just by looking at photos of them that they represented different periods of time. Um, and so it's not easy to correlate sites here just based on lithology and stratigraphy. So we had to do it based on chronology and then magnetostratigraphy. Um, and so I'm just going to show you a quick example of some of our geochronology results. Um, so here's a rank, these are, these plots are rank order age distribution plots where the X axis is rank order and Y is age. And each of these dots is one single crystal total fusion experiment on a sanidine grain from a particular ash. Uh, and then these two samples are from the same ash collected at different horizons. And this ash is about one centimeter above the impact horizon. So it's our best way to basically date the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. Um, but the important point that I just want to highlight here is what uncertainty level we're getting from these. Um, so the uncertainty we're achieving is about 30,000 years for these 66 million year old deposits. This is at one sigma. And so if we interpret that into the resolution we're able to achieve with geochronology alone, um, assuming we have an average sedimentation rate of 10 centimeters per thousand years, and then on average, we have a two sigma uncertainty range of 60,000 years. That means with our argon geochronology, we're getting a resolution of about six meters, which is fine. It's good. We're getting high precision results. It's great. Uh, but we can get better resolution with magnetostratigraphy. Um, and so as an example of some of our magstrat results, I'm going to focus on the eastern part of our area. And so here I'm showing four different stratigraphic sections where we were able to determine the C29R, C29N reversal. And at all of these sites except for one, we were able to identify the reversal within a one meter resolution at one actually within 10 centimeters, which is pretty great. Um, and so this allows us to correlate these sites together at a higher resolution than we're able to achieve with argon geochronology alone. Um, and so by doing this at these 18 different sites throughout the region, um, we can create this really high resolution framework of faunal change. Um, and so now jumping back into the big picture, tying together our geochronology, our magstrat, and our paleontological results, uh, we were able to determine that mammalian faunal decline began between 400 and 150,000 years before the mass extinction event. 
Um, and then we see that early mammalian recovery phase is constrained to the first 328,000 years of the Paleogene. And finally, we're not seeing full mammalian recovery until 1 million years after the mass extinction event. Uh, and so now the big question or big picture question here is now that we have these results, how do they compare to records of climate change, the marine realm, and also the Deccan Tract? And so that moves us on to the next part of the project, which was calibrating Cron C29R. Uh, and so what do I mean here by calibrating? By calibrating, I mean obtaining high precision ages for the reversals that bracket this cron. Um, and so by doing this, it will allow us to provide high precision absolute ages to sections that rely on magnetostratigraphy for geochronology. Um, and then that these high precision ages are directly comparable to our results from the terrestrial realm. So we can now directly compare our results once we calibrate the timing of these reversals. And so to do this, we utilized our argon work that we already collected and paleomeg we already collected from the Hell Creek. Uh, we utilize linear interpolation between dated ash horizons that bracket a magnetic reversal to determine reversal ages. Um, for C20 and R, C20NN, we did this at six sections. For C30 and C20NR, we did this at two. And we repeated this at different sections to kind of um, average out complexities and sedimentation. Obviously, this is a fluvial system. It's not um, linear sediment or constant sedimentation we know didn't happen, um, but if we can kind of average it out between sections, um, we should be fine. And then also it's to improve the uncertainty of our final ages um, by having it from different sections. And so here's our result. Uh, we have these two new ages for these boundaries with pretty high precision, um, which is shown by the gray bar here. And we can see that our new ages nicely correlate with ages that were determined using uranium lead by Clyde et al. And then also are nicely correlated with GTS 2012, which is dominantly calibrated with astronomical tuning. Um, but now, since they're calibrated to argon-argon, that was determined in our lab, they're directly correlatable to our terrestrial results. And so using this calibration, we can now estimate the timing of climate change using our ages um, in marine sections. And then further, we can compare our terrestrial results to what was occurring in the marine realm. And so what we see is that uh, global warming ended about 150,000 years before the mass extinction event. Uh, and we see we have this late Cretaceous cooling phase that was within the last 259,000 years of the Cretaceous. We also observe that the onset of climate change roughly correlates with terrestrial ecological stress um, and the onset of that. And that here is measured by mammal evenness where smaller numbers are increasing or indicating increasing ecological stress. And then finally, we observe that both the marine and the terrestrial realms are recording this long phase of recovery. Um, and these environments did not fully recover until over 1 million years after the mass extinction event. And so now the next big question is, is how does all of this correlate with the timing of Deccan volcanism? And did Deccan volcanism feasibly cause these climatic changes that may have been perturbing terrestrial env environments? And so for this work um, to assess the timing of the Deccan Traps volcanism, we worked dominantly in the Western Ghats region of India. Um, and we chose here because we have great access to some of the best exposed continuous sections of Deccan lava, uh, which is nicely highlighted here in this aerial photo over the Western Ghats. And then also the Western Ghats records the most voluminous phases of Deccan volcanism. And so these phases are arguably going to be the source of the climatic change if Deccan was indeed causing that climatic change in the late Cretaceous. Um, and so previous work in the Deccan before we went there and obtained high precision geochronology results had identified that most of the Deccan stratigraphy had reverse polarity. Uh, and so people had previously assigned this to Cron C29R um, but there's still some questions about this. So the uncertainty in the, or in the ages previously obtained was plus minus a few million years. So it's possible this wasn't C29R. And so despite identifying this one as C29R in some studies, uh, those same studies also identified this cron, not as C30N, but as a much older cron, um, suggesting that there was a large gap in volcanism and a hiatus represented here. Um, and so with old geochronology, we couldn't test that, but with new geochronology, we can. I just want you to kind of keep in mind this um, polarity sequence. We do have most of it in, in one reverse problem. Um, and so for sample collecting, we collected 36 samples. 
um, in eight sections, from all chemical formations. Um, and for this work, because we were dating basalts, we didn't do single crystal analysis on sanidine because we didn't have sanidine. We used multigrain aliquots of plage, which has a lower potassium content, so we're going to be getting lower precision. And so here are our results. This is plotting stratigraphic height versus age. Um, and so what I want you to basically take away from this figure, I don't need you to look at this in too much detail, is just that uh, our new dates nicely cover the Deccan stratigraphy. We don't have large gaps in our stratigraphic analysis. Um, additionally, we were able to achieve reasonably high precision for all of these. Um, so plus minus about 100,000 years for a higher potassic unit and then a few hundred thousand years for a lower potassic unit. Um, we also have stratigraphic superposition now, which you'd think wouldn't be a problem, but all the old dates, you did not have that. So this is a huge improvement. Um, and one of the important questions we wanted to be able to answer with our new data is where is the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary? Um, as you can see, plotting that age here, we have multiple of our dates overlapping with it. Um, and so to determine the most likely age, we used um, a Bayesian analysis program called Bacon. Uh, and using that analysis, we determined the most likely position for the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary is at the bushy polypore chemical boundary. Um, and so using this position and our new dates, what are some of the takeaways from our new geochronology? Uh, and now just to note, we're now plotting versus cumulative minimum volume, not stratigraphic height. And this is because these upper three formations are particularly voluminous. Uh, we observe that 90% of the Deccan volume within the Western Gaps erupted within a million years. That's a pretty short period of time. Uh, and then that 75% of this volume erupted after the mass extinction event. Also with our new dates, we can now confirm that this is indeed C30N, this is indeed C29R, and this is C29N. And so this is going to be really useful because now we can correlate our results in the Deccan at higher resolution to these other marine sections, other terrestrial sections, uh, without having to worry about the fact that our uncertainty on some of these is a couple hundred thousand years. And so it's helping us correlate at higher resolution now knowing where these reversals are and what magnetic crons these are assigned to. And so in addition to working in the Western Ghats, we also worked in the Rajamundri Traps um, province, which is across India over here. Um, and so the Rajamundri traps are a particularly small outcrop of lavas. Um, and the reason why they matter is because these lava flows may represent some of the largest volume Deccan traps eruptions and also the longest lava flows on Earth as they're about a thousand kilometers from the hypothesized Deccan eruptive centers in the Western Ghats. Um, and so the Rajamundri traps have long been associated with Deccan to, or due to their um, chemical similarity uh, so people have suggested that they correlate with the Ambanelli and Mahabaleshwar geochemical formations. And then also due to their rough age, people have associated um, or have identified the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary here um, between these two units. Uh, however, using our new high precision geochronology, we now know that these chemical formations are younger than the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. And so either uh, this is not recording the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, or these lava flows are not associated with the Deccan traps. Uh, and so jumping into our results uh, for these three flows, uh, we performed both paleomagnetic analysis, argon geochronologic analysis, and then also biostratigraphy on some of these layers in between. Just kind of quickly summarizing our results, we see we have two reverse flows, one normal. These top fl or two flows are clearly younger than the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. But this lower flow, well, it has very large uncertainty. And this uncertainty overlaps with the age for the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. Um, this high uncertainty is because this particular lava flow had very low potassium values. Uh, so we're not going to be able to improve the precision of this state with more geochronologic analysis. But fortunately, uh, we can take these dates and assign crons to these particular reverse and normal intervals. And so we know that this is C29R and this is C29N. So now we can actually use our reversal ages, those ones that we determined in the Hell Creek, to improve the precision of our estimates for the ages in the Rajamundri traps. Um, and so that's exactly what we did. We can go, or convolved our Rajamundri trap states uh, with the reversal ages from the Hell Creek to improve precision. Um, and so you can see that we were able to improve the precision of these lava flows. Uh, which helped us determine, along with the biostratigraphy, 
that the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary is not recorded here, and that these lava flows most likely are correlated with the Ambanali and Mahabaleshwar formations, therefore representing a very voluminous phase of Deccan volcanism. And so kind of now tying all of our results together, what do we see? Uh, we see that this long recovery phase that we're observing in both the marine and the terrestrial realm is uh, oddly similar to this duration of Deccan volcanism that we have occurring after the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. And also it occurs where we have this major pulse of volcanism uh, that we see in the Raja Mudra traps. And so it's possible that Deccan in some way is inhibiting recovery from the mass extinction event. We also see that our onset of terrestrial decline and late Cretaceous warming uh, roughly coincides with the onset of Deccan volcanism. Uh, but this pre-Cretaceous Paleogene boundary climate change is only correlated with the eruption of 25% to 50% of the lava volume released. Whereas after the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, when we have 50 to 75% of the volume being erupted, we're not seeing significant climatic variation. And so the climate response is not what we expected. Uh, so the assumption going into this, which is commonly used when looking at large igneous provinces, is that the amount of gas release should be um, similar to when you're having the largest volume of eruption or of lavas being erupted. So volume of erupted lava should correlate with amount of potentially climate modifying gas being released. Um, but what we're seeing with our new results for the decade is if Deccan is perturbing the environment, it, it's from the eruption of this 25 to 50% of the volume, but not during the eruption of this 50 to 75% after. Uh, so the climate response, again, is, is not what we expected. Uh, and so in this way, the role of the Deccan is still kind of unclear. And we still have this outstanding question of whether or not there were large amounts of climate modifying gas, such as CO2 or SO2, released by Deccan prior to the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary that could have caused that observed climatic signal um, and ecological stress. And so this question is kind of the focus of some of my future work. Um, and so in order to assess this, I'm working on this in two separate projects. So the first one uh, is a recently funded NSF grant with Marissa Tremblay with uh, Katie Bristol, who's my student working on this project. We were working to constrain the tempo um, of eruptions indicating basically how long were eruptions lasting, individual eruptions themselves, and what was the hiatus between them. Uh, and this is because volcanic gases that are released from large igneous provinces that could affect climate have variable residence times in the atmosphere. And so it's possible if in the eruption of pre-Cretaceous Paleogene boundary lavas, maybe those eruptions were really, really frequent. They didn't have long hiatuses between them. So these volcanic gases could have built up more and perturbed the climate. Whereas maybe during the um, post-Cretaceous Paleogene boundary eruptions, uh, we have large hiatuses and therefore these gases aren't building up and so we're not seeing climate change. Um, and so right now we can't use geochronology to assess this uh, because this is a much, much, much finer scale. And so instead in this project, we're using a combination of cosmogenic helium-3 uh, and then also secular variation analysis. So more paleomagnetic work is gonna be used to answer this question. Um, and this is gonna include traditional directional group analysis, and then also kind of this new quantitative secular variation um, work that I've been doing with Tishar Mittal. And then our hope ultimately is to tie our estimates for this into new modeling of basically what we expect the earth system response to be of this long-term release of carbon and sulfur um, and we're modeling this using the lost star carbon cycle model. Um, and so I have one minute left, so I'm gonna quickly jump into a little bit of what I mean by quantitative secular variation analysis. So this is, this is new um, and I'd, I'd like your guys' input on this. Um, so we have traditional secular variation analysis. So we know the field varies on short time scales. Um, and generally what that means, if you're measuring directional change in lava flows, ones that record very, very similar directions, uh, well, you can, assume erupted on a time scale that was shorter than secular variation. Uh, whereas then lava flows that record different directions must have had a hiatus duration that was longer than the time scale of secular variation. And so by mapping this out and creating these directional groups, which are ones that have similar directions, uh, we can generate kind of a relative eruptive history 
on the millennial to centennial time scale. But this isn't quantitative. This is kind of rough estimates. People commonly use what we assume modern ranges of secular variation are. And so we sought to try to do a more quantitative analysis for this. Um, so we're utilizing a generalized forward modeling approach uh, to compare synthetic eruptive histories that we derive from downsampled secular variation records. Uh, we've used this on CALS 10K, GGF 100K, TK03, and then also site U1336, which is an IODP core, um, to try to get our you know, secular variation records that we're downsampling. Uh, we compare it to real data sets using a Bayesian inversion framework. And this can help us assess eruptive history, including duration of eruptive pulses, active eruptive time, and hiatus duration. And right now, we're not seeing really a difference between which of these we're using. Um, and it's possible secular variation was different way back in time. Um, but if we assume, at least around the eruption of the Deccan, we're seeing a similar reversal rate to today, um, we can probably assume secular variation was similar. But this is something that's still to be tested. Um, and so to quickly summarize, we did this uh, using old data, uh, got an estimate of six to 9,000 years between eruptions um, and less than 200,000 years between pulses. Uh, we tried this in other large igneous provinces and we're seeing some differences. So it's potentially a powerful tool, um, but it needs more work. And it really relies on good geochron and paleomeg and a good stratigraphic framework. So that's kind of a quick summary of what that is, but feel free to ask questions or if you have an idea on how to do it a little bit better, great. Uh, come talk to me after this. Uh, and so at that, to summarize, role of Deccan is still a little unclear, uh, but there's more work to come, so stay tuned. And I hope I've shown you guys that Paleomag is still a really powerful tool for deciphering some of these big picture questions in Earth history. And so at that, I'll say thank you, and I will stop my presentation. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, we have a uh some time for questions and then we'll, we will be going into a, a 10, break, 10 minute break. I mean, 20 minute break, sorry. Any questions? Well, I had a question. Yeah. Comment. Yeah, I really, um, it's a lovely talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and so, um, you're using secular variation to kind of quantify gaps. It's, uh, of course, risky, but it's kind of cool. Um, one of my worst papers was something where I proposed using transitions to correlate in a sedimentary environment. And of course, it, it was not a great idea. <laughs> but it, it was there. And I, I so I'm sympathetic to your attempts. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm hoping some of the cosmogenic work will help actually test some of our models. Um, yeah, and it, it seems promising so far, uh, and our estimates seem reasonable for what one would expect eruption durations to be. Um, so, but yeah, needs a little bit more work. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's a cool idea, and obviously you are proceeding with due caution. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So you um you determine these very high precision uh, ages for those cron, cron boundaries, and I was wondering uh, what sort of uncertainties you might put on those boundary ages, and you know it, it takes time for the field to change. We're not really sure how long the transition lasts and so on. So I was wondering if you had any kind of quantitative feeling for those. Yeah, yeah. So for our particular, the boundaries that we looked at, um, we, I, we added an uncertainty in this like absolute position for where we are identifying the reversal um, that basically encompassed the entire um, amount of sediment that was in between our last normal and our first reverse or the opposite if we're looking at the, the other type of reversal. Um, and so we incorporated that full uncertainty of basically how much time may have been encompassed to reverse um, in that. Um, and so for the C29R, C29N reversal, we were getting an uncertainty of around, I think it's like 15 to 20,000 years. Um, which seems reasonable. So that's basically encompassing kind of what we might expect also the, the reversal duration to be. Um, 
And then, and we had incorporated into that uncertainty also our uncertainty in the position of the reversal within that full, like, here's our last normal, here's our first reverse. Um, and then for the other C30 and C29R, um, our uncertainty was a bit higher because we could only identify it at two sections. Um, and so that was, I think our uncertainty on that's about 50,000 years. Um, so a few more dates might be able to kind of hammer down the precision with higher N, um, which is what we were able to do with the other one. But we are trying to incorporate kind of um, what uncertainty one would expect as well with um, kind of our fully encompassing that entire interval between our you know, last normal first reverse. Um, so incorporating that kind of uh, excursional behavior period. Um, All right, so you've got sort of the transitional time uh, and then you've got the dating. Uh, yeah. Uncertainty. yeah, so kind of like the transitional time is being incorporated into our uncertainty on that boundary. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Hey Courtney, this is Anthony Coppers. Um, I have a question. So in the beginning, you um, you highlighted there's like a 0.4% kind of uncertainty that we're still dealing with in our arc and Arcan community yes. regarding decay constants and the standards that we use. So given that you have pretty good polarity control in the Deccan traps, do you think you could turn the, the table around and with your age dating and the polarity control improve on that 0.4%? Uh, <laughs> Uh, do you mean in the sense that we have uranium led geochronology also for the Deccan? Well, or at a, either terrestrial where we have, you know, polarity control in a terrestrial environment. Uh, so possibly. So I'm, I'm hoping that with, with the KPG, there are so many opportunities for intercalibration between our technique, um, between our technique, between different settings, between different labs, but then also between our technique and other techniques. Uh, so everywhere we've kind of dated, uh, the uranium lead geochronologists were already there or followed. Um, and so there are a lot of these boundaries, including the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary and including the entire Deccan sequence that hopefully will provide us with opportunities to try to improve upon that um, kind of uncertainty and standard calibration in the, in the argon world. Um, it's a little tricky in the Deccan because some of the uranium lead dates are from their layers in between the lava flows that have been interpreted to be tephras. Um, and they might, their, their ages are modeled assuming that there's like magma residence time that they're accounting for. Um, but I'm hoping Blair Shaney and I have kind of been talking, we have some potential for we might try to look at sanidine within those as well and see if there's silicic um, components, potassic components that we could try dating. Um, but I do think that the Deccan and also the KPG in general provides hopefully some future opportunities to try to improve um, intercalibration between argon, between labs, but then also um, with other dating techniques. So yeah, so I'm hopeful. Um, yeah, we would absolutely be willing to share some of this material if you wanted to try dating uh, KPG or Deccan. So let me know. Okay, great. Thank you. 